Hi everyone, I'm Bethany Kisser and today I'm going to be talking about Lev Vygotsky's theory of social interaction. Lev Vygotsky was born in Tsarist Russia in 1896. Um, he was Jewish and at that time there was a lottery because Jewish students were only allowed to fill a 3% quota of the student population. He was chosen and he studied psychology. Um, he had a relatively short life and a short career, but he was able to write seven books and many articles, many of which are still being translated from Russian, um, before he passed away in Moscow in 1934. Vygotsky's theory is based on the idea that learning influences development. He said that babies are born with certain mental functions, which develop into higher functions through learning. He said that development occurs within a social context. He said that learning um, is a social, it occurs through social interactions, and the social interactions occur within a cultural context, which will influence how children think, not just what they think. And then he said that language plays an important role in mental development, starting because it's the main method that parents and teachers use to share information with children. I'm going to go into each of these in a little bit more detail as we go on. So, um, development occurs through learning. Um, babies are born with four elementary fun mental functions, according to Vygotsky. These are attention, sensation, perception, and memory. And as children learn through social interactions with others, these elementary functions develop into higher mental functions, eventually leading to independent thought. Development occurs within a social context. Parents and teachers transmit knowledge to children. They are what is known as a more knowledgeable other in Vygotsky's theory. Um, social interactions with the uh, more knowledgeable other and really with any, um, any other person move a learner towards a more um, independent thought and more independent pursuit of knowledge, which drives cognitive development. Um, cultural context will determine how children think, not just what they think. Um, this is because memory strategies are going to be different across cultures. Um, for example, we have a written language, and so our strategies for memory include like note taking, which would not be the case in a culture that does not have a written language. Mnemonic devices um, are also going to be culturally based. Um, for example, some that I make for my classes uh, make no sense to my students because they're rooted in some kind of early 2000s pop culture that they're not familiar with. So just that difference in time culture um, makes it an irrelevant mnemonic device and therefore not how my students think. So the more knowledgeable other I referenced as being a parent or teacher, but Really, it can be anyone who has more knowledge or skill um, regarding any given task. So typically it is a parent or teacher, but it can be a more skilled peer or even a computer. And sometimes it can actually be the child is the more knowledgeable other than the grown up, for example, in beating the most recent video game or, you know, setting up your brand new iPhone. Um, the more knowledgeable other is going to assist the learner to do a task that is just beyond the learner's independent reach. They're going to provide verbal instruction, model behavior, give hints, ask questions, give encouragement. These um, social interactions between the more knowledgeable other and the learner are going to lead to learning, which as I discussed, lead to development. So I said that the more knowledgeable other is going to be helping the learner to complete a task that is just beyond the learner's independent reach. This is in what Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development, which is just the area between what a learner can do on their own and what they cannot do at all. So things that fall in the zone of proximal development are tasks that they can do with a bit of assistance from someone else who knows a little bit more about the task. And this is where learning is going to take place when the task is just beyond the learner's independent reach because if it's too easy they're not challenged they're not actually learning anything new but if it's too hard they're going to get frustrated have some kind of mental block and not do it at all it's important to keep in mind that every child's zone of proximal development is going to be a little bit different and that's why um, differentiation is so important in a classroom you need to know what each child is capable of and what support they need to get them to the next step. So the last part of Vygotsky's theory is the importance of language. So it starts because language is used by the more knowledgeable other to transmit their knowledge to the learner, the child. Um, children starting around age two develop social speech. 
and they use it to talk to the more knowledgeable other and anyone else. Um, and it develops as a result of the social interaction that they've had with the more knowledgeable other. Um, starting around age three, they start to develop what Vygotsky called private speech, which is external verbal speech, but it's directed at themselves. Um, he argued that this has a um, intellectual function. It's a way for them to communicate with themselves, to guide and direct, strategize and organize their ideas. Um, they're used to receiving this verbal support and direction from the more knowledgeable other, but now they're starting to be able to supply it to themselves. Private speech um, develops regardless of culture, but we do see it develop faster in children who are in a highly verbal environment. Private speech um, gradually fades away by about age seven, but it doesn't go away. It just becomes internalized into inner speech, which serves the same function. Um, you're still going to talk yourself through something, you're just going to do it mentally in your head. So the same functions of organizing your ideas and directing your actions just now in what Vygotsky called inner speech, which eventually becomes thoughts. So how can we um, apply this to our classrooms? Um, Vygotsky never actually used the term scaffolding, but scaffolding is, is an example of assistance from a more knowledgeable other. Um, if you think about what a scaffold is, it is a temporary support that helps people get from one level of something to the next. And in a classroom, scaffolding is a support that helps a learner accomplish a task while moving to be able to do the task on their own. Um, it allows them to complete a task that's within their zone of proximal development without getting bogged down by the details that they can't master yet. Um, for example, vocabulary. Um, a student may not be able to understand the meaning of an entire text simply because they can't understand a few words. But if you supply those vocabulary words ahead of time, they'll do just fine getting the meaning of the whole text. So that would be an example of a scaffolding support that you could give would be to pre-teach vocabulary. Um, the important thing to remember with scaffolding is that it needs to be fluid and adjust to this student's progression. Um, you need to gradually um, reduce the interactions with the more knowledgeable other and any other supports um, so that responsibility can be transferred to the learner as they progress in their skills. Um, and then, of course, their zone of proximal development is going to move to slightly more difficult things. Scaffolding was originally um, designed to be one-on-one -on -one with a more knowledgeable other, but in order to really work in a classroom setting, it's been um, changed a little bit, and now a scaffolding support can be a written source or a computer-based source, depending on what kind of support you need to use in the situation. As I mentioned, um, most of the time you, the teacher, are the more knowledgeable other in the classroom. You're going to be the one giving instructions, guiding, giving hints, asking questions, giving encouragement. But sometimes the more knowledgeable other can be a more skilled peer. Sometimes peers are just more able to explain um, a concept to their friends than you, the teacher, are. And students can even learn simply from the social interaction that they have with their peers. Um, some more examples of scaffolding, showing an example of a final product. Um, I have my Spanish 1 students make a family tree project when they're learning the vocabulary associated with families. Um, when I say a family tree, some of them have no idea what I'm talking about. Some of them know exactly what I'm talking about and get to work right away. Um, some of them I show them my example one time, they look at it, it's great. They move on and make their own. Some of them need it right next to them, not because they're copying, but because they need the reference. And so that example is their support while they work on their own family tree. I already talked about pre-teaching vocabulary. Graphic organizers are a great way to bridge the gap between learning about something and writing about something. Not every student is gonna be able to make that gap, but a graphic organizer is a good way to get their thoughts in order before they start writing. And then guided questions um, over any material that you've covered. Um, this is a good way to get kids to think about and analyze the material in a way that they wouldn't necessarily on their own, but they're totally capable of doing. The big thing here is waiting for a response. There's that awkward silence where they're all just thinking. You have to wait through that and don't, um, you know, take the opportunity away from them by giving them the answer too soon.
So some discussion questions, um, and I'll post these in the discussion forum as well so you have them as a reference. Um, how do you use social interactions to improve learning in your classrooms? And what are some specific examples of this strategy? What are some examples of scaffolding that have been effective in your classrooms? Do you plan to implement any new scaffolding techniques? Why or why not? And what, if any, problems would you foresee with social interactions and scaffolding in your classroom? And how would you combat these? Here are my sources. I'm going to post these in the discussion forum as well, so you can refer to them if you would like any more information about anything that I talked about. I hope my presentation has been helpful, and best of luck to you all.